behalf of Godrej Material Handling, I welcome you all to our next and 30th webinar from our Godrej Storage and Handling Knowledge Series titled Typical Answers a Supply Chain Manager Should Seek While Setting Up a Warehouse. Before I move on to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, let me just revisit the core purpose of running this knowledge series platform that is built specifically for inter logistics domain. I would say it as a Godrej way of giving back the knowledge that has been gathered since six decades now to the society and the industry. And I'm happy to express that time and again, the encouragement that we get every time has always increased with overwhelming response from you all. Coming to today's topic, one of the main achievements for a supply chain manager would be a hassle free movement of goods from raw material stage to the hands of the end user. And to achieve this, he has to go through a lot of process, a lot of decision making. He has to uh, deal with uh, lots of vendors, set up uh, warehouses, set up uh, logistics uh, systems and all. OK, so in our in our today's webinar, typical answers a, a supply chain manager should see while setting up a warehouse. We would have an interactive session wherein our speaker would highlight on key answers that a supply chain manager of a company should see before setting up a warehouse in space. Our eminent speaker, Janak Bhausar, needs no introduction in Godrej Material Handling Division. He's a part of Godrej Material Handling Division since six years now. A seasoned product manager in the warehousing industry began his career in B2B sales before moving into product management and has worked with over 500 customers to develop practical solutions for their material handling and warehouse management needs. He's an expert in MHG, racking and warehouse management and is a dynamic and engaging speaker with a wealth of information in these areas. Janak has extensive knowledge derived from years of hands on experience and in depth study of practical use cases and case studies. He has unique ability to connect with audiences and del deliver informative and impactful presentation. Before I invite him, I would request everyone to put in their questions in the chat box on the top right of your screen, which I'll try to answer them straight away or towards the end of the session. Please do not forget to write your name in the box above and Q&A section. That will help us to get back to you after the webinar in case we miss your question. With that, I request Janak to take over and wish everyone has an insightful session. Welcome, Jan. Hi, Dashit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, yes, today's topic, if we move to today's topic, it is typical answers or supply chain managers should have, right? But uh, as you also know, supply chain consists of almost uh, everything. So, it, it consists of the raw material, planning of the raw material, then, uh, you know, uh, finished good inventory and in between, you know, inventories logistics, transportation, basically it covers how a company would basically plan its inwards material and it would uh, uh, apply to a timely delivery of the finished goods to the end products. But today we are going to focus on only the uh, warehousing part of it or maybe the internal movement of material part of it. Indeed, in the, in the so, whole purpose, the whole purpose of uh, setting up a supply chain uh, system is to increase the efficiency by and reducing the cost. That's why a supply chain manager is there, and his whole purpose is to uh, foresee uh, how a raw material uh, becomes a product and any, which is any material, any yeah. material for yeah. that matter, how correct, it moves. Correct, correct, correct. So first, first, the supply chain manager has to uh, when he when we are thinking about in terms of. Uh, a warehouse or a space, let's say, not a warehouse or a space where he will be storing the material. It, it, uh, he needs to think about optimizing that space. Indeed. Now, when we talk about optimization, optimization has, uh, it, it would mean optimized space would mean would look different for a different customer, right? Okay. So, uh, optimization means basically that you have ideal uh, amount of everything. Making most out of it. Now, Correct. So now when we talk about optimization, first we need to understand what are the different elements of a warehouse or what are the different elements of a uh, 
uh, storage space per se. Now, uh, uh, just allow me one moment. Yeah. I'll share my screen. Let me know when it is visible to you. Please. Definitely. Is my screen visible? I'm using a second screen. Should be yes, visible. Okay. Yes. Is it visible? Yeah. Yes. So as as we see here, hmm. as we see here, this is uh, I've, I've just tried to compile a typical material handling application or a typical warehouse or how does a warehouse look. Okay. So this will help us understand what are the different characteristics of a warehouse. OK, hmm. so the first and second area is the docking operations. Okay. So your docking operations here, the unloading and loading will happen. Uh, pallet forming and breaking will happen. Hmm. So you know your container will come. Okay. You will unload the material here. Or you will unload the materials from the racks, or you will unload the materials from the uh, shelving or order picking system, okay. and you will keep it here for loading, mm -hmm. right? Indeed. So uh, uh, this is a docking and unloading station. Here you can have multiple activities going on. Mm -hmm. So as I said, pallet breaking and forming. Let's say you are a you are a flip cart. Okay. Now you want to take one mobile from one pallet. You want to take one pant from another pallet. You want to uh, uh, put another uh, SKU from another hand pallet uh, from another uh, pallet. So your that sort of a sorting or you can say pallet forming will happen in this docking application. Okay. Now let's say if you are an e-commerce company, then you require a huge docking app, a huge docking area. Correct. Now contrary to that, let's say you are a 3PL company. Now, where you do not require a docking application, you just need racking mm -hmm. and you need to take the pallet out, put it in the uh, container when it comes and you just have to dispatch it. Right. Now, if you are a 3PL company, then you do not require a docking area, but you require a, a huge uh, racking area per se, right? So optimization of the space depends on what is your application. Okay. So as, as we, I'm just uh, dig digressing, but we were coming at different elements of a warehouse. So first is the docking station. Uh -huh. Second is the transportation area. So this basically what you see BOPT forklifts or uh, uh, feeder equipment. Basically, we call them feeder equipments, hand pallet trucks. Okay, Hand handling Deal from a docking area and you take area or a racking area or an order picking area. So okay. these are the material movement or basically transportation bay that we okay. call it. The second and third part of it is which which you will be the max which you will see the maximum which occupies the maximum space in a warehouse and that is a storage basically an actual storage. So in storage also you have multiple types of storage. So you may have a racking, you may have some area for order picking, mm -hmm. then you have some area for shelving. So these are your core storage uh, facility. Okay. where you are storing the material it could it could go as high as 13 meters it could go as high as 17 meters mm -hmm. it could be a horizontal storage it all depends on what are the sqs that you are storing it could be a mix of all okay right let's say you are handling some uh, finished good let's say you are handling some raw material so raw material could be in the vertical racking mm -hmm. finished good could be in the shelving mm -hmm. so it could be a mix of it all mm -hmm. and then uh, we don't see this much but then there is some bulk storage also okay. so you may have some uh, storages in the middle or in the corner where you do not require any racks so these are uh, maybe a uh, big boxes or uh, you know uh, drums you store one on top of each other okay. so you, it will be too high three high such kind of a storage so this is how this is a basic this is how basically uh, a warehouse or a storage space would be divided so so, then, yeah. so whenever we talk about optimizing we would talk about optimizing this layout okay now as i was telling you a uh, optimized layout for a uh, e-commerce would be let's say 50 percent of storage and 50% of docking solution okay, or docking area or uh, uh, optimized solution for a 3PL company would be maximum storage and maybe a minimum of docking area. Okay. Now in maximum storage also if you use a particular type of rack you would get let's say 30% uh, uh, volume coverage. Mm -hmm. Then if you use a double dig system then you would get 50% uh, uh, volume coverage. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what kind of a racking system that you are. So we divide it. We divide the uh, concept into two parts. One is storage and second is handling. Okay. So you have to optimize the storage also and then you have to optimize the handling also depending on the storage that you are using. Okay. So, right. 
So uh, as we understood that, you know, this is how a warehouse space would look. And these are the different uh, elements of those may it be the feeder system or the different types of racks that you mentioned. But uh, what should go for home and means, you know, what application can you uh, just uh, elaborate on storage systems that you mentioned different storage systems like as you mentioned the racks and then the shelving and where it would be. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a that's a very good system. So that's a very good question, I would say. So uh, you asked me what are the different types of storages and how to optimize them. Okay. So uh, to for the benefit of understanding, let me I add one presentation. Uh, can you see my screen, Dashit? Uh, not yet. Now, no. Ah, yeah, it has come. It has come, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, this is these are the different types of the storage systems. I I just had uh, this. Uh, we had this covered into one of our uh, previous webinars. Okay. So I I'll go in a very very briefly through this system. Correct. So as Racking, as I told you, uh, storage makes up for almost 70 to 80 percent of your uh, complete layout. Okay, so we'll spend a little bit more time on this. Mm -hmm. Now, in storage, we divide this storage into two parts. One is racking, another is shelving. Now, what are the what is the difference between a racking and a shelving? So the racking consists of any storage uh, uh, system where the pallets are involved. Okay. So it will have standard racks and you have to whatever you want to store. You have to store it on a pallet. Mm -hmm. It could be a wooden pallet. It could be a plastic pallet. It would be your non standard pallet uh, uh, metal pallet, but it will be a palletized load. Okay. So you will require a MHE for handling the load into a racking system. Right? Now in shelving shelving may or may not have MHE shelving does not necessarily need a pallet. Mm -hmm. It can be normal shelves. It could be bins. It could be a loose material kept on a shelving mm -hmm. and you may have a person traveling across the bay and picking up the material as in how it requires okay. or as per his uh, packing material. So basically it will not require MHE. We do have MHE for shelving also if required and shelving sometimes uh, does require MHE, but it is it's a it's a may and may not wala situation. Okay. Correct. Okay. So this is a major difference between racking. Now racking and shelving. Now uh, moving to the pallet racking systems. These are the different pallet racks that are, that are available, and we may uh, go in depth later on when we uh, go ahead. Okay? okay. So the first pallet rack that you see on the left hand side, uh, at the top row, is a selective pallet racking system. Okay. Now this is a, a very simple uh, pallet racking system. It's been there. I mean, you will see 80% of the warehouses in India with this kind of a pallet racking system. Okay. It's simple to install. It does not require much capital, mm -hmm. uh, upfront capital. And um, uh, since it has been around uh, ages and it is very easy to install, you will see this into multiple people yeah. uh, yeah. using it. But, but as we go ahead, as we understand more and more uh, pallet systems in depth, mm -hmm. our supply chain manager could choose a different type of a pallet tracking system mm -hmm. depending on uh, the depending on his application or depending on his uh, requirement mm -hmm. if he has a knowledge of it all. Okay. Okay. okay, so you may still choose a selective pallet tracking system. You may still choose that this system works best for you, but at the same time, you should be aware, or a supply chain manager should be aware of the other systems that are there in the system okay. that are there in the market, okay. and so that he can have an informed decision. Yeah, that's why we are here. Correct. Yeah. So first is a selective pallet tracking system. We will go about. Uh, we will understand uh, a little bit more in depth later on. Okay. The second thing is the same iteration of selective pallet tracking system, but a very narrow IL system. So here what happens is uh, in selective pallet tracking system, you may have a IL space. Let's say IL space is the space that you keep for the material handling equipment to pass through in between. Okay. So in very narrow IL type of a system, your IL space reduces to almost two, two and a half meters. Mm -hmm. Whereas in selective pallet tracking system, you may require a three to four meter of IL space. So your IL space reduces. So you have to use some specialized equipment for uh, VNA systems, yeah, okay. correct? 
Second thing is let's say a double deep system. Now a difference between a double deep and a selective pilot tracking system is that instead of having two pilots back to back, you have four pilots back to back. So your one aisle reduces. You use some special uh, equipment and uh, uh, to handle these pilots, and you do not get the hundred percent selectivity. Okay. Now, uh, Dashit, I think if we, if we if I take each and every systems okay. one by one, I think that will be easier to understand. Yes, why not? Please, please, yeah. please. Okay. So first, let's talk about selective pilot tracking system. Now, this is a typical system you must have seen in multiple warehouses, correct? Here, what happens is, can you can you see my cursor? Yes, yes. Okay. So here, what happens is, uh, this is the aisle. The MHE goes into this aisle. Okay. Okay. And one MHE can handle a pallet on the left side or on the right side. Okay. Similarly, another MHE will go into this aisle. It can handle um, pallets on the left side or the right side. Correct. So as you can understand, it has. 100% selectivity of the pallet. Hmm. So all the pallets that you store here, it is visible to you and accessible. for choosing and accessible. Yeah. It is compatible with MHG, which can work in uh, this bigger aisles. Okay. And the cubic space utilization for this particular system ranges between 18 to 28%. So let's say you have a 100 by 100 by 100 uh, meters ka cube, mm -hmm. then you will use somewhere about let's say 20-25% of the cubic space for the utilization of uh, racks. Rack, the yeah. rest of the space would be uh, uh, would you you would have to keep it vacant for vacant for MHEs to pass. Correct. Right. The second one that I told you was a double deep racking system. Mm -hmm. Here, what happens is if you see this this particular rack, mm -hmm. there are two pallets here. There are two pallets here. Correct. So th this this is the racking system. The yellow this and the round one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a double deep racking system. Okay. Here, the first pallet is called the first deep pallet, and the second pallet is called the second deep pallet. Okay. Or a double deep pallet. Okay. Here you get 50% selectivity because the pallet which is at the double deep position, you do not have the accessibility to it unless the first pallet is taken out. Correct. Correct. So here uh, you get a better, uh, you get a denser uh, storage mm -hmm. because you eliminate one aisle instead of two aisles. Now you require one aisle, but two, but but then you have to use a specialized equipment, mm -hmm. and you do not have the selectivity for all the pallets. Yeah. So if you are if you are someone who uh, you know who's using a FIFO system, it cannot work here because the first pallet. The first pallet will SK, go inside, SK, and that is not the first pallet which can come out. SKUs should be, should be same. Yes, uh, if you have similar SKUs, then if you have a batch production where you know you are producing one batch, you are filling the entire rack and you are emptying the entire rack, then this kind of a system works best for you okay. because there you do not have to have a selectivity Correct. because the SKU is the same. Correct. Correct. So uh, if you see at the bottom image, which is the actual application of a double deep pallet, uh, here you can see that this specialized equipment, which is called a double deep restruct, yes. can access the second pallet. Yes, the second pallet. Yes. While 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 staying in single aisle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So here you get 50% selectivity. Uh, this type of a double deep racking system is uh, you can get almost 30-33% more pallet than a standard SPRS system. So let's say you are getting a hundred thousand pallet position mm -hmm. with this sort of a system, you right away get thirteen hundred pallet yeah. position. Yeah. So let's say if your aim is to increase pallet position as much as possible, mm -hmm. you know many PPL companies they charge rent based on the pallet position. Yeah. If your aim is that, then this sort of a system works best for you. If it's a freezer conditioning, if it's a cold storage. Okay. Now, as you know, you need to store X amount of pallet. Now, if you increase the volume space, then you your Expense for cooling that space becomes exponentially higher. Hi, so there you require less space but more pallet positions. Okay. That's where we see a lot of double deep uh, okay. pallet going. Okay. Uh, okay. System going. Okay. Uh, this is suited with more pallet SKU store. Mm -hmm. Operator skills is a little bit more, and you require a skilled operator to okay. use this. Okay. Third type of pallet is pushback racking. Now this is this is not a very common racking system, but it is still used somewhere where you require dense storage, but the SKU is same. As you see here, all the material that we are storing, it is refrigerated. Okay, okay. everything is same. So here, what happens is uh, you take one pallet, you put it on a uh, you put it on a uh, pallet, then you take another pallet, you push the first pallet back so that the second pallet goes into the second level. Correct. Then you take another pallet, you push the first pallet back, the entire three pallet moves back. 
So this is how the entire row of the pallets are formed. Okay, this is a pushback racking. Okay, it is a very dense type of a storage, but here you cannot handle the pallet. You cannot handle a pallet which is which is a very heavy pallet. Okay, you know, imagine if the pallets are one one and a half two tons heavy, and it is a four uh, lane uh, uh, or a four row mm -hmm. pallet. Then when you want to push the fourth pallet inside, you have to essentially push All almost. Four and a half ton of material inside, which is not possible for any equipment. Mm -hmm. okay. So it can be used for a uh, lighter pallet. It can be used when the SKUs are similar. The to to solve the uh, to solve the issue of let's say uh, leaving the aisle space inside, we have a mobile pallet, uh, driving pallet packing okay. system. So as we as I as I told you before, you cannot push four pallets together from the outside. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, what if your entire equipment can go inside and you don't have to push the four pallet? Okay. So that's where this is the drive-in pallet tracking system. Here, what happens is each and every row is open from one side. Mm -hmm. So your entire equipment from taking the MHE goes inside and puts the first pallet. Okay. Then the equipment comes out, takes another pallet, puts another pallet. So you do not have to push the pallet from uh, each side. You can put one, one, one pallet, and the system fills from the back to front. Okay. Okay. So it's a it's a very dense system. You get almost 80, 85 percent of the volume storage that uh, volume capacity storage that you want. Okay. Uh, the only problem with this type of a system is that you get absolutely, I would say, very, very less selectivity okay. because if you want to take one pallet which is at the center of the system, the you cannot that pallet out. You have to first empty the entire system below it and above it. Same, same like. so, so similarly, if you have similar SKUs, you can uh, you can use this. Uh, if you have a batch production, you can use this type of a system. Correct. Got it. Similar yes. like uh, double D, but in that uh, you know you have only two pallets, but here it is n number. Correct. 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 First, and first. Absolutely correct. Now, now the third one is the mobile pallet tracking system. This is a this is a fairly new system, and which we see a lot many customers now opting for it. Okay. Now, what does mobile pallet tracking system solve? Is it gives you the flexibility of a uh, SPRS system that is a selective pallet tracking system, and gives you a density utilization of almost a drive-in system. I would say. Okay. Okay. So let us assume that you have this much of space. Okay. In left side which is a selective pallet tracking system you can fit only three uh, racks now in mobile pallet tracking system what happens is we put uh, the racks on a roller roller racks okay the okay. entire rack can move from left to right okay these are so you will, ha, correct it can move from left to right so here instead of putting two aisles mm -hmm. you can only uh, account for one aisle where the equipment can go in and then whichever rack you want to access, you just open up the aisle there and you go, the MHA goes inside and takes the pallet out. Okay. Right. So this kind of a system, if you have, let's say 15 racks, mm -hmm. then in selective pallet tracking system, you need to put 14 aisle spaces. Okay. Whereas in mobile tracking system, you have to put only one aisle space mm -hmm. and whatever, uh, whatever space that you save by not putting aisles, you can use that space to put racking system. Right. Right. Great. This is a this is a very dense system. This is a very dense system. It yeah. works uh, fantastically. You can have selectivity for almost all your racks. The only thing is that since it is uh, you have to move the entire rack, it's a slow system. Okay. So if you are someone who are looking for a throughput of 30 pallets per hour, 50 pallets per hour, 40 pallets per hour, this kind of system will not work for you. Okay. Another disadvantage or another limitation for the system is multiple MHEs cannot go inside. So let's say you have five restructs and you want to put all five restructs inside, then you have to account for five aisles. Then only one aisle cannot no work. Space. Okay. Okay. There is no space for another restructs. Then you have to put multiple aisles. You have to put that many programming. Then it becomes a tedious system. Okay. But if you have a small system, if you have a small space where you require a very, very dense system and you need to have selectivity as well, mm -hmm. plus your throughput is not very high. This is a system where a supply chain manager or a warehouse manager can opt for. Right. This is a mobile pilot tracking system. Yeah. So this is a actual photo of a mobile pallet tracking system. Here we are. We can access our uh, rack one and two. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you want to handle rack three and four, then you just open up that space and the rack moves.
this is just a brief summary that uh, I, I had made. So how the uh, utilization, cubic space utilization moves as you go higher. If you see here, the mobile pilot tracking has the highest cubic space utilization. Right. Yes. Right. And now we come to shelving. So as I told you before, uh, we had more, uh, racking and then there is a shelving. Without so shelving, there will be multiple things. So shelving could be uh, uh, ground based shelving. So first and second row, let's say, uh, could be a shelving. Then you would have shelf racks. So if the first thing that you see is our bins, then second thing is the shelf on which you put the uh, loose material. The last, uh, the, the third thing is the mobile stack. So it is, it is like a uh, Almira which moves from left to right, and you can shelf there. Then you have multi-tier system. So many big customers like uh, Geo or uh, Amazon, for that matter, mm -hmm. they have this kind of a system in, uh, you know, in combination with uh, the racking system also. Okay. So this is a multi-tier system. You have uh, six levels, seven levels of shelves, okay. and that there will be stairs. The the person will go up. Even MHEs can go up. So as you see on the right side, hand pallet trucks or a small uh, BOPT will go on the third level, okay. move with the pallet, and he can form the. So how, uh, do, uh, how do they uh, put if MHEs are not used? Okay, but then how do they put the materials uh, uh, and on the sixth level or fifth level? Yeah. So in in you are talking about the multi-tier system, right? Yes, yes. Uh, it looks similar to the selective pallet tracking, means racking system, yeah. It, it looks similar, but it is not. So okay. if you see at the center, there are stairs to go up, right? And at, at somewhere here, somewhere here, there will be an opening. So what they do is hmm. uh, from the bottom, you have a equipment like a reach truck or okay. uh, any other equipment which will take up the pallet and put it at this level, third level. Okay. okay. So there is still a dock. Hmm. So you have to put the equipment there. So they'll use the MHEs, but MHEs are used outside, not inside. Okay. As soon as you put the pallet at the fifth floor, then someone will come with a hand pallet truck or someone will come with a trolley okay. which will empty the pallet and put it in the shelves. Okay. Right. And and now it has been it 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 is developed, you know, far ahead of it. There are conveyors, there are sliding conveyors from each floor. Okay. So, you know, if you want to, let's say, uh, have one toy you you put a order of a toy from amazon mm -hmm. amazon has that toy on let's say second level mm -hmm. so a person will just take that toy put it on the conveyor which is like a, a slide mm -hmm. it will come down to the conveyor at the bottom and it gets directly uh, to the billing area okay. and packing area okay. so all the things are now there okay, okay. so these this these are the different types of uh, storage and how to optimize it so you can optimize it once you know about everything. So, so he got to understand the whole process uh, inside a warehouse, uh, inside a warehouse. Okay, uh, wherein uh, how do how do the material comes, where do they get stored, and what are the different storage system. But uh, I also understand that you have mentioned you mentioned uh, MHEs and uh, restruck. Okay, so what are the different equipment uh, that one should go for, uh, so so that you know he shouldn't. Uh, um, uh, offer something different and it is not useful for him. As you mentioned about throughput, if uh, if uh, you need a fast system, then what MHH should I go for? Or if I have got SPRS, then what would be the best thing? Or if I'm a company like a 3PL uh, setup wherein I have got everything, okay, uh, SPRS, I've got shelving system. and all. So what would be the best thing uh, for me? Can we you know, understand? From you, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Darshit, uh, you are correct. So, you, just putting a right racking solution or just putting a right storage solution will not help you maximize, uh, uh, will not help you even take the advantage of that uh, system, correct? So, you do require a suitable MHE. I'll, uh, I'll share one presentation. Let me know. So when we talk about the MHE, it, it's a very vast field. You know, uh, you can use, let's say, a restruck in an SPRS system. You can have a restruck, which is. It's visible. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Yeah. So you can have something. Uh, you can have one MHE for. Uh, I, I'll just talk about, let's say, a BOPT, a, a battery operated pallet truck. Now the same okay. BOPT can be used to store the pallet at the bottom level. Okay. 
Sure. The same POPT can be used for a docking application. That is, you know, take a pallet and put it inside a container. Mm -hmm. It the same POPT can be used as a feeder equipment for a bigger equipment like a restruct or racking system. Mm -hmm. The same POPT can be used as a transport equipment to transport a pallet from location A to location B. Okay. Could be used so, in shelving also in multi-tier. Uh, a similar, uh, a smaller BOPT like, uh, you know, uh, lithium and BOPT or a semi powered hand pellet truck, it can go into shelving also. Okay. And, and though it is not correct, but many of the companies use the standard BOPT as a order picking equipment also. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it is, it is a vast thing, but we'll just cover up uh, briefly about what are the types of MHEs and we will, we will focus only on the MHEs that are used in the warehouse. Okay. Great. So can you see the chart? Yes, yes. Okay. So this I had prepared for one of the customers. Okay. We we have multiple MHEs. I have not covered everything. Okay. I just wanted to focus on MHEs which are usually used in a warehouse yeah. because as a supply chain manager and currently we are focusing on the warehouse part of okay. it. Okay. So this is just one slide and maybe some uh, support slide that we'll go through. Yeah. So first and foremost is the Pallet trucks, okay. the leftmost thing that you see, or somebody uh, would call it a hand trolley, Sorry. or somebody yes, yes, the hand trucks, or a pallet trucks, or something like that. So this is a very standard equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it nothing is powered, everything is manual. You get almost 2.5 ton capacity. You have 5 ton capacities also, but uh, it's it's a manual thing. You do get a stainless steel version of it if you are a pharma company somewhere where you have to follow those compliances of non corrosion and all. We, uh, we can have a stainless steel hand pellet also, but more or less the working remains the same. Okay. You know, you it's a difficult machine to work with. If your load is higher, then you may require uh, more than one person to handle it. Docking and uh, you know, using it on a slope is difficult. So these are these are the conventional machines and in any factory or any warehouse you will find at least one hand pallet truck lying somewhere because without it you cannot work. Correct. That's what I said omnipresent. It is omnipresent. It's an omnipresent equipment. Everywhere. everywhere you must find one of it. Indeed. One of Indeed. it. Okay. Now the upgraded version of it is powered pallet trucks. Okay. Now okay. In powered pallet trucks, you may have a bigger equipment as you see down, mm -hmm. which is like a two ton or a three ton machine, or you may have, you may see a lighter equipment. As I told you, there are lighter BOPTs okay. to work on mezzanines, to work on uh, uh, shelving systems in in shelving systems. Okay. So these are the lighter BOPTs, or we call it semi power semi hand pallet trucks or semi powered hand pallet trucks, something like that. These are lithium ion powered. Fantastic. It's a uh, it's something which has come up into in the industry since last two, three years. It was not there before, okay. uh, but it is gaining popularity now. Okay. Then then we have stackers. Now stackers can go uh, in India. We have stackers which goes up to the height of 6.5 meters. Uh, whereas if you see a Europe or a US market, the stackers are restricted to 4.5 meters only. Okay. If you want to go above 4.5 meter, then you have to go and take a restruct. But in India, we do not have that sort of a that stricter compliances. So right now we can offer stackers up to 6.5 meters. Okay. There are people who offer 6.5 meters and all. Mm -hmm. So till 6.5 meters, you can have stackers. Stackers, the uh, in stacker, the uh, the operator will be standing. Mm -hmm. He will not have an enclosed space, mm -hmm. but it can do your uh, racking application. So that is stacker. Now, if you want to go higher than that, then there are restructs. So restock is a complete warehouse equipment uh, and uh, almost all big warehouse will have a restock. Mm -hmm. So it starts from one ton, goes up to two ton and it can go up to 13 meters of height. So okay. that is a restock operator sitting here. It's a proper equipment uh, and and you, you can have multiple different types of restructs. So you would have something like a single. So in, in restock only there is a single deep and double deep restruck. Then there is a European style and a US style restruct. Okay. You know, we call it a mast moving and a fork moving restruct, something like that. Okay. Then in restruct only, you would have uh, maybe a cold storage application restruct, which could be used in a cold store. Um, and multiple, any many features and, uh, you know, safety features or uh, performance boosting options can be given on okay. this. Then we come to order pickers. Now, order pickers are something which is a uh, standard and established categories in uh, a category in a Europe and a US market, mm -hmm. but it is still uh, gaining popularity in India because in India, what happens is we use the 
इक्विपमेंट लाइक रिस्ट्रक फॉर ऑर्डर पिकिंग एज वेल यू नो रिस्ट्रक के फोर्क के ऊपर पैलेट लगा दिया आदमी को हार्नेस बांध दिया एंड देन द पर्सन कैन ऑर्डर दिया बेसिक थिंग करेक्ट सो दैट इज दैट इज नॉट द करेक्ट वे बट इट इज स्टिल हैपनिंग बट देन ऑर्डर पिकिंग इज गेनिंग पॉपुलैरिटी नाउ इन इंडिया सो ऑर्डर पिकर्स वुड बी अ डेडिकेटेड इक्विपमेंट वेयर देयर विल बी अ मैन कैबिन द पर्सन कैन गो अप विद द पैलेट एंड टेक द मटेरियल फ्रॉम द रैक विद हिज हैंड हाउ ही रिक्वायर्स ओके सो सिंस ऑर्डर पिकिंग इज अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ अ डिटेल्ड फिनोमेना आई विल जस्ट टेक यू थ्रू इट लेटर ऑन uh then we have a very narrow aisle trucks so these are the equipments you do you remember we discussed yeah, the vnl yeah. tracking system yes yeah, very narrow right? tracking system yeah so for that you require some specialized trucks so these trucks are the trucks which can operate in an aisle of 2 to 2 and a half meters and can go at a very very high height okay. because that is how you get the maximum uh, storage out of a sprs system right. correct so these are the specialized equipment for that and then at the last we have forklift so you may ask me forklift warehouse mein kaise use hota hai you don't use forklifts in warehouse but you may be wrong there mm-hmm. forklifts are still used in a warehouse for docking application it could be an electric forklift it could be a diesel forklift okay. there are forklift which are designed to go completely inside a container ah. you know the ah. entire forklift can go inside a container can and unload the container in as fast as 20 minutes or uh, 40 bit container in 20 minutes yeah. you can use forklifts to do this kind of an application of course it it should not be used mm-hmm. into the racking system mm-hmm. ideally but uh, for docking and unloading of the container or emptying the container okay. the forklifts are used yeah. mainly okay now as i told you uh, these are the order pickers okay so order pickers also you have a lo- low level order picker then you have a mid level order picker then you have high level order picker so the the one that you see right now is a low level order picker let's say you want to pick the pick something mm-hmm. from the first row and the second row okay so here in india people use bopt so instead of a order picker they use a bopt put the pallet in front mm-hmm. and they take the order there but this is the real way of doing it which is a low level order so this product must be very useful to uh, uh e-commerce company wherein they have multiple yes sir. e-commerce company e-retail company ah retail okay that's yes. that's, where, that's where it is used even the quick commerce yeah correct so this is these are these are the types of order picker as i said the the mid level order the low level order picker will be for the first and second row the mid level order picker would be let's say it will go up to 3 and a half 4 meter height mm-hmm. and then there are order pickers with mast where you can even go up to the height of 11 12 meters the person himself will go at the height of 11 meters and can pick the uh, material these are the typical application as as you were telling me where it is used these are the typical application where it is used now this is a high level order picker here the person himself is going up at the height of let's say 10 12 meters oh okay right now uh, as i was telling telling you about the restruck yes, now since restruck is also a vast field okay. these are the basic types of the restruck okay first is the mass moving restruck which is very common in india the first one the entire mast comes ahead and that is how we call it so why it is called a restruck is because the fork reaches out okay. Okay. so first time first is a mast moving the mast itself reaches out and the second one are, are, is the us type restruck where a fork reaches out the mast stays stationary okay here you have a single deep restruck and a double deep restruck so if you want to handle a double deep pallet this is how the pallet double deep restruck works hmm. so in a single deep system the the restruck will handle the first pallet whereas a double deep restruck can extend its fork for the second deep also yes i could see and, uh, you have to you can pick up the second deep pallet here the out trigger goes inside the racking if you see the out trigger at the bottom so, so these are the small small things if you are designing a double deep racking system then you must have <clears throat> bottom beam this is called a bottom beam okay so basically your pallet is not sitting on the floor there is a beam on which the pallet sits so that your restrucks out trigger can go inside okay it's a small thing but so, still needs uh, to uh, one question i would any advantage in uh, uh, in the second type of restruck that you showed with one one caesar is this one yeah yeah the middle one this one right yeah. so you are asking me that there is a single deep restruck here and this is a single deep restruck as yeah. well what is the advantage yeah. okay so see uh, as such there is no difference mm-hmm. this type of a system where there is a pentograph as a single deep system mm-hmm. they are they tend to be sleeker so okay. the the restruck is narrower 
it will take a little bit of less space but they are more expensive to manufacture okay okay so that is why it is used mainly in the us market where the space is a constraint but the budget is not okay whereas in indian market or apex market i would say the space is still a constraint so i would not say it is it is abundantly available but then people are still uh, much right, concerned right. about the price of the restock yeah so that is why uh, the moving mass restock comes into the picture okay and then there are very narrow aisle equipments so these are the equipments which can work in an aisle of uh, it can start from 1.7 and 2 meter 1.7 to 2.2 2.3 meters and it can go the left one that you see it is an articulated equipment that can go up to the height of 12.5 meters okay and then the right if you see that is a man up machine now the articulated equipment the person is at the bottom and the fork goes up okay the right one is a man up machine where the person himself goes up wow. this can go up to the height of 17 meters so you can imagine almost 50 53 feet high mm-hmm. you are there and these kind of equipment requires a little bit of uh, consideration on what kind of floors that you have what is the application that you have uh, whether you have guide assist system or not okay. everything needs to be considered for that so i think that covers the type of mhes that you can use i'm i'm sure i must have left some but almost all i've covered everything which is uh, used in a warehouse great having understood understood all uh, these aspects of uh, warehouse the mhes uh, that are used the racking systems uh, as the person is going at 12.5 meter or 13 meter you said how do we ensure means the safety of uh, uh people working over there mhes the rackings and the infrastructure as you mentioned uh, lately uh, that what infrastructure uh, do we uh, go for or uh, the rack uh, the safety measures should we take correct so uh, dashit if i understand your question correctly i'll i'll break it up in two parts so first of all you are talking about the safety of a person when he is using a man up machine yes okay. so i would say the equipment itself is made in a way that there is no human error and the person is stable up uh, at the top so it will have all kinds of stability controls it will have uh, you know uh, uh, leaning control if the angle becomes higher it will stop okay. plus you need to have super smooth flooring so what we call as a zero zero flooring okay. the equipment itself is a guided equipment so as soon as it goes inside the aisle mm-hmm. the steering stops the mm-hmm. person can only go up and down okay. because there is a wire guided or a rail guided however but it is a guided equipment it cannot be driven inside the tracking system okay. so all that kind of a safety is ensured when you are uh, offering a man up machine okay okay now second part of your question was the safety of the entire warehouse Indeed. now for that uh, just give me one moment so when you talk about safety of the entire warehouse there are multiple things so first we have to ensure and i think i should start with this uh, slide then then of human plus machine plus Uh, combination of twelve meters, twelve meters high structures, man-made structures. I mean, correct, correct. So I'll just share this screen. Let me know when it's visible. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's visible. So I'll just. So this is a video of one of the accident uh, oh, that was captured on a CCTV. Okay. In a warehouse. What what just happened? I mean, that equipment was just there. I mean, how did this happen? Yes. So as you oh, see, domino effect. Domino. So your warehouse is a completely dense and full warehouse, right? Uh-huh. so if your equipment uh, or uh, more even even touches one of the component and and something happen a huge accident is just there right it is waiting to happen so when you are talking about safety mm-hmm. and that to safety in a warehouse mm-hmm. i think this equi- this video is self explanatory uh, to uh, to you know convey the importance of the safety, the safety work in, the in yeah. a warehouse right so that is why we Uh, or i would suggest i we suggest everyone or every supply chain manager warehouse manager 
uh, even someone who is not a manager, even a forklift driver, to mm-hmm. focus to give maximum emphasis to safety. Okay. Mm-hmm. So okay. when we analyze the uh, and to uh, when we analyze the accidents which happens uh, for MHE, this is how the graph came out to be. Okay. If you see here, the maximum uh, percentage which contributes to an accident is either a toppling of equipment or pedestrian or a workman coming under it or a workman was riding the equipment, another workman was riding the equipment. So it is all about the, uh, I would say, unsafe driving uh, practices. Unsafe driving practices. Because the MHE equipment itself is almost uh, three, three and a half, four ton of self weight. You know, it will have that much of a self weight. Plus, you will have load on it. So it becomes, uh, you know, it is a responsibility of the operator. It is a responsibility of everyone around the equipment to ensure that the safety is uh, met. Okay. It is given safely, and that is why we have multiple safety accessories that we give. So that you as a user or you as a supply chain manager or a warehouse manager do not need to worry about the equipment. So first is the all-in-one access control. We can have access control over equipment. It could be a biometric control. It could be a pin-based control or a or a tag card-based control. So that you know this ensures that only a certified operator or someone who is authorized to use that equipment will drive it, and you 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 are you do not have that headache that anybody can use yeah. the equipment. Right. Then we have multiple safety accessories like a blue light or a red light, you know, blue light or equipment which is coming out of an aisle Mm -hmm. so that you have a visual indicator of where equipment is coming. Then you have alarms or you have a red hello light, which will, you know, uh, give a red indicator around the forklift so that no one should come near or no one should cross this barrier. At least they will have an indication that, you know, if someone is around. At least you will have a visual barrier. Yeah. Then you have reverse sensors. If you are reversing, just like how we have in car, if something is at the mm-hmm. end, then it will beep. Then you have camera systems. Let's say you are using some equipment for 8 meter high, 9 meter high. Operator will have visibility, but he will have less visibility. Okay. So to see the folks, he will have, uh, you will require a camera at the height. Plus you have cameras around. Let's say someone requires a camera at the back to see what is happening at the back uh, at, at all times. So that can be provided. So uh, these are, and this is a very, the safety list goes on and on. And whatever you require as a safety accessory, if it even if it is not there, we can give you as a non-standard safety accessories if it's available in the market. So the, the safety for the MHE is covered. And as we say, you are the most important device on the forklift. So you have, to, we have to first train the operator. No matter how many safety uh, accessories that you give yeah. on an equipment, if the operator himself is not trained to drive the equipment safely. Mm-hmm. Uh, it becomes very difficult to keep the equipment safe. Great. Great. So we have our own training department. We train the operators. Mm-hmm. We always recommend to you uh, that the operator be certified. Mm-hmm. There should be special training. So all that things can be uh, done to ensure the safety of the equipment and to ensure the safety of the, uh, I would say, racking system. The racking system are more or less uh, static. So the safety equipment comes with it. Uh, row guard, beam guard, column guards. These are all uh, now standard as a safety feature okay. when we we will maybe consider a racking system per se. And, and if we uh, see uh, as a warehouse as a whole, Okay, uh, let's say if it is of 12 meters, 15, meter, uh, 15 meters, there are means there could be some chances of uh, it getting means, you know, fire, uh, uh, danger of fire. Okay, so yeah. for that, uh, uh, do we have some uh, outlet, yeah. exit, so, safety so, exit, so, fire exit, ventilation or something? Correct, correct. So there is an entire guide of fire safety, which okay. has been given by the warehouse organization of India, okay. which every warehouse has to follow. But that that would not concern the supply chain manager much because that is that needs to be complied by the warehouse from which you are leasing it. Now, most warehouses are leased warehouse, right? So you will be given a warehouse space and you have to start your operations there. So the the fire and uh, fire and safety guidelines has to be followed there. So you should have sprinklers. You have to have two back back exits. You have to have one emergency exits. That emergency exits should not be blocked by anything. All that thing needs, is followed mainly by the warehousing lease uh, uh, company or from, from where you're taking the warehouse. But if it is not followed, then there is a separate code 
which covers a lot of thing there is there is, there is like a, a that, whole lot of things that, that, that a company has to follow company has or to manager but, has to follow. but but when you consider about the racking and mhe part of it so in racking also uh, if you have sprinklers so at the top of it you will have an opening for the sprinklers uh, which which can sprinkle the water hmm. right up to the bottom so all that arrangements are done in the racking system okay. so that way it is covered great yes dash uh, so uh, there is one question. OK, uh, so as uh, as this has come, any special consideration while selecting MHEs for a uh, drive in system? Yeah, so uh, see, as we discussed about driving the uh, drive in, the entire equipment goes inside. Now, now here you have to consider two things. Correct. Okay. First of all, your equipment should be compact enough to go inside a drive in system because let's say you are using a 1200 wide pallet. Right now, drive-in will have uh, a blocks like this, and the pallet sits on the block. Correct. So, if, if you have a 1200 mm wide pallet, mm -hmm. then your drive-in system will not be wider than 1400 mm, obviously, because if it becomes much wider, your pallet will not stay there. Now, your width of the equipment, let's say you want to take a forklift inside, and the width of the forklift is 1400 mm, then it will not go inside. So that is the first thing that you have to uh, ensure that the equipment which is going inside is a, a compact equipment it can it can actually go inside okay. and the second thing is that it should be a guided equipment so you uh, we always recommend people do use uh, driving equipments without any guidance but we always recommend that it should have a guide rails at the bottom so as soon as the equipment goes inside the steering is not operational so it should go straight and come back straight there should not be an option of having a steering okay, okay. because imagine if you take the forklift inside it goes cross and you while coming out, let's say operator turns the steering and it starts going into the racking. It becomes a huge, uh, what do you say? It can be an accident. It could be an accident or an incident at least. Okay. okay. So these are the things that we ensure. So having understood all of these things, uh, I miss, I'm putting myself in uh, the shoes of uh, supply chain manager. So now I have, uh, let's say for an example, I've got two projects. One is green project, one is brown project. OK, and in one of the projects, uh, the um, requirement uh, it is for, let's say it is for an e-commerce company and uh, the requirements uh, doesn't have much, you know, it is inconsistent. Let's say in festive season, I would need more MHEs or more mm -hmm. storage spaces or means, you know, uh, in uh, non festive season, I, I don't need an equipment over there or any such infrastructure okay. and in a uh, green project. OK. So how, demand, yeah. so how do I go about it? Means what are the um, which is the most important part? The money, okay, the investment, right. OPEX or CAPEX. So what are the options that are available in the market, or how should I go about it? Okay. Right, correct. So, so, so see, any business would require uh, investment. Yeah, right? Any <laughs> business would require investment. Now, the type of investment or uh, how to go about it that depends on organization to organization. Right. Okay. Till now, many of the organizations believed into buying the equipment, you know, take a loan from the bank, but buy the equipment, take the asset on our books and uh, then go about it. Now, let's say, as you said, you are expanding. You have one greenfield project, one brownfield project, multiple different projects going on. And how do you manage your cash flow yes. or how do you uh, own? Uh, how do you start these projects together? Indeed. So that's where a very good concept comes into the picture. I'll just, uh, and this is a very good question. Whoever asked it, just give me one minute. Yeah, I think I found it. No. Huh. Yes, that should let me know when, when you see my screen. Yes. This is good. All right. So I think what, uh, Someone who has asked this question means this. Okay. How do you manage your cash? Hmm. Okay. okay. So now we have three options. Earlier we had only one option. You buy the equipment, we sell the equipment, and you manage your funds. Okay. But now we have three options. You can buy the equipment, you can lease the equipment, or you can rent the equipment. Okay. Now what is the difference? Now buying is very simple. You have to manage the cash. If you if you have credit lines or if you have the cash, you can go ahead with buying. But the second and Third option is lucrative, and that is why it is gaining more popularity. Now. Okay. What is lease? So lease by definition is very simple. 
uh, it's a contractual agreement between two parties one party will own the asset and it will give the rights to use the asset to another party okay. and he will pay a periodic payment correct correct it's a very simple thing it has uh, it uh, industry was doing it uh, for multiple equipments like you know laptops and all they don't usually buy it it is on always lease even the properties are leased Correct, correct. It's on lease. So uh, and the leasing option for land was available and is used since ages now. Correct. But now that concept is coming into uh, capital equipments like MHEs or rackings or warehousing equipments or you know anything which is used in a warehouse or for that matter even a complete warehouse also. So you can lease a complete warehouse like a made warehouse each and everything of a warehouse you know starting from a desk or door everything. Uh, okay. furniture yeah everything can be leased out so leasing in in lease also will will just cover this in a very uh, briefly uh -huh. so one is operating lease and second is a finance lease uh -huh. so what's an operating lease let's say you think that i i want to use this equipment uh -huh. and uh, after 5 years i don't want this equipment i'll buy a new one okay. or my, my technology will change a new equipment will come so how do you manage that so that's an operating lease you know okay. we sell the equipment to a leasing company you lease it from the leasing company with an agreement that after 5 years i'm not going to take this equipment so they'll give you a periodic payment you pay that equipment and you use that equipment okay the second thing is a finance lease hmm. we sell the equipment to the leasing company you have a contract agreement with the leasing company that after 5 years i'll buy this equipment at let's say xyz value maybe 10% value or 15% value and till then you will pay a periodic payment so what happens is you do not have to pay up front after 5 years you still get the equipment in your hand you don't have to pay up front so you have cash in hand you can use that cash for 5 years correct you can make money from that cash and after 5 years you anyway have the option you to buy own the, the equipment nice option own the equipment so like now what is the emi scheme as just like an emi scheme but but what is the benefit that you get, get in a lease is you can take tax benefit okay. emi is good for you and me uh, where we do not have a company and we can't take tax okay. benefit if you are a company you can take tax tax benefit on this okay so as as, some, as everyone says you know cash is king so you, you need to have cash in hand you need to have cash in hand so how do you manage the cash hmm. so that's a, that's where the lease comes in picture okay now as we talked about uh, early, as we just talked right uh, talked right now there is operational lease and then there is finance lease now you would say what is the difference between operational lease and a rent because in operational lease also you are taking equipment for 5 years and after 5 years you are returning the equipment correct in rent after uh, you use the equipment you anyway don't own the asset correct at any point in time yeah. at any point in time but in lease you get savings on tax okay what happens is uh, i this is a finance uh, uh, terminology mm -hmm. but just to explain in a very simple term let's say you buy the equipment you are allowed a depreciation of 15% mm -hmm. you know as per the indian law correct so it takes almost 15 to 18 years to write off the asset so okay. the yellow line that you see is mm -hmm. tax benefit okay. so you uh, uh, the uh, you get tax benefit of sorry blue line that you see is tax benefit in buy so you get very little benefit in buying because you it takes almost 15 to 18 years to write off the asset correct whereas in lease the entire lease amount can be written off so if you tell me i want to uh, uh, use the entire lease amount in 3 years i'll give you a 3 year lease if you want to write off the entire amount in 5 years i'll give you a 5 year lease okay so the entire amount is, whereas you require 15 years you can require only 5 years in terms of lease and you can write off that amount you can show it as your uh, uh, expenditure okay. and you can take tax benefit on it okay so i just have a case case study so asian we just have a case study of asian paint okay. so asian paint was one of the company who were using the equipment for 7 to 8 years before replacement okay then uh, recently they have gone for uh, leasing okay. and now they uh, take the equipment on lease for 5 years and after 5 years if they if they want to return the equipment they return the equipment if they want to use the equipment for another 2 years the lease amount that they get is minuscule okay. that's how they uh, uh, increase the cash in hand smart and this is very encouraging i mean very encouraging very encouraging there are multiple companies who have now gone into leasing agreements okay. or started to lease the equipment mm -hmm. or warehouse for that matter so that is one option that you have you can lease the equipment if you don't want to uh, uh, you know block your capital correct, correct. second thing is the rent the rent is a very simple thing we own the equipment we give it to you okay. so why why people are going towards rent 
it is very convenient you don't have to put any capex it goes into your operational budget plus you have to maybe that is not uh, maintaining the equipment or keeping the equipment is not something that you are uh, expert on that that is a oem which is expert on so from oem you take the services on the rent and not the product it is convenient to you you know just just how it is urban clap you know you just call them happens right. even on rent it, uh, the oem maintains the equipment it is very convenient for the uh, company that is going for rent yeah for short term if i need the equipment for one one or two years okay i could go for, for short term yes. it is called quick turnaround yes. it is called quick turnaround yes. let's say today you require restock tomorrow you require order picker then you require a forklift also Indeed. then you require uh, another restock that, that's what you meant by seasonal demand right let us say uh, like coca cola coca cola will require a lot of equipment during summer or before summer right. then uh, flip card so they will require multiple more equipment during the billion days so all that things can be met the, uh, by rental or you would have a combination of a rental and a buyout so you would have let's say you plan your capacity as per your average uh, uh, usage and then whenever you require more or whenever there is there is a, a peak you rent some equipment that is how it happens plus the renting helps you stay uh, uh, you know use the contemporary technology also you don't have to use only one equipment for 7 8 10 years mm -hmm. or 30 years down the line you can upgrade you can upgrade faster and you can take benefits mm -hmm. Right. And there are different types of rental solutions, so we won't go about it. You can rent equipment, you can rent a person, you can rent equipment plus person, etc. So, so, so these are the multiple options that you have. The so right. there is nothing like uh, everyone can be everything can be accommodated, and I do not. Uh, any, and there is something for everything sort of a thing. Yes, and this this is all. This was an eye opener for me actually. Because leasing has so much of uh, advantages. And yeah, yeah. you know, so it, it is you, so somebody not everyone, like an old system that you know we have to invest in an equipment and exactly, exactly. So everyone thinks that leasing is something like uh, how how can I lease a uh, MHE or how can I lease a uh, forklift? Everything can be leased. Everything can be leased. It it just needs to have a value, and the leasing company is not concerned much about what you are leasing, but they are more concerned about your company and your credit profile and etc. Indeed, indeed. So, in the interest of time, we are almost done. Uh, I'll I'll take few questions. I mean, there are many questions that are coming up. Okay. Uh, any uh, what do you say? Yeah. yeah. Any special consideration while selecting MHEs for shuttle racking system? I think the uh, achha, shuttle racking yeah, system. Shuttle. So shuttle i think we have not covered shuttle racking system so what happens in a shuttle racking okay. system is that uh, there is a, a shuttle which takes the pallet so you put the pallet on a shuttle mm -hmm. you place the shuttle uh, in whatever uh, height or row that you want the pallet to go okay. and the shuttle then electronically takes the pallet inside okay now here what you have to consider is since you are using a shuttle and the shuttle is outside of the system. Your your equipment stays. This is your let's say rack. Okay. Your equipment stays away from the shuttle mm -hmm. uh, or the racking system. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put the uh, pallet in the system. Okay. So your load center increases. I mean, we have not covered load center. Okay. So what happens is it's it's a very uh, simple to understand thing. Let's say if you handle a bucket. If I ask you to uh, lift a 10 kg dumbbell. Mm -hmm. You can lift it up very close to your body, okay. but if I ask you to lift a 10 kg dumbbell away from the body, it becomes difficult for your shoulder. Right? So as you go away from the equipment, your lifting capacity goes down. So a two ton equipment will lift two ton near the body, but may lift only 1.5 ton away from the body. So when you are using the equipment for a shuttle racking system, the only thing that you have to consider is you do not have to consider the designed capacity. Okay. Of the equipment. Let's say you may think that this is a two ton equipment. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But no, you have to see the derived capacity, which this is thing. the capacity which is away from the this thing. So you have to add maybe 150, 200 mm to the standard load yeah. center, and then you have to come up with the capacity there. Okay. okay. That's the only thing that is. Okay. I'll take this last question. What factors should be considered while selecting an option between lead acid and uh, lithium ion powered equipment? I mean, okay. So uh, again, uh, now this the battery something. technology is going. Yeah, okay. battery technology has increased a lot. I, I, I have a one second. Since we do not have time, I'll just take this question. Yes, uh, yes. By the way. So see, 
in terms of usage a lead acid battery and a lithium ion battery has uh, absolutely no difference okay. so let's say a uh, xyz capacity of lead acid battery and xyz capacity of lithium ion battery if somebody thinks that xyz capacity of lithium ion battery will perform better then that is wrong or perform better in a sense that it will perform longer then that's wrong some people will say that if you put lithium ion battery you don't have to buy any additional battery okay this is a false statement Lithium, the benefit of lithium ion battery is that you can have opportunity charging. That means you can charge the battery whenever the equipment is not in use. Okay, whenever you are near the charger. Yeah, so correct. So if if you are going for lunch, you can charge the equipment. Same if like you're mobile not phone. Using, just like mobile phone. If if you are on a break, you can use the battery. Hmm. But what if you do not have breaks? Correct. There are some customers who do not have breaks in their application. I have seen those customers. now if those customers go for a lithium ion battery it is absolutely uh, a waste for them yeah correct right? because they will anyway have to buy another battery correct right. correct right. so if you are someone who have a lot of breaks in between your operation and you have multiple shift operation let's say you have you want to use the battery for th- two shift or three shift then in lead acid battery you cannot opportunity charge so what you have to do is you have to buy another battery okay. so you have to keep two batteries you have to maintain two batteries mm-hmm. and you will have to swap those batteries between the shifts okay. if you want to avoid all that you can go for a lithium ion battery where you can charge it in the lunch break you can charge it in the midway and you can use the same battery ahead and ahead now a lead acid battery will work will uh, work for almost 1500 charging cycles a uh, lithium ion battery will almost last you for about 3000 5000 charging cycles okay okay so the life is more accordingly the cost is also more but if if you are someone who first of all do not have a multiple shift operation you have only one shift operation mm-hmm. or you have multiple shift operation but you do not have time in between your operation is so extensive that you only get half an hour of break in 8 hours of shift then you have to go with lead acid battery because otherwise lead acid battery lithium ion battery does not work with you so it is not something just say it's not a messy how of batteries you know you shift to lithium ion or life become jinga lala वैसा नहीं होगा एनर्जी ऑफ कंकशन कन्वर्जन इट विल रिक्वायर चार्जिंग इट विल रिक्वायर चार्जिंग इट विल रिक्वायर टाइम टू चार्ज ऑफ कोर्स देयर आर फास्ट चार्जर्स एंड एवरीथिंग अवेलेबल बट इट इज नॉट समथिंग व्हिच सॉल्व्स ऑल योर प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ बैटरी मेंटेनेंस it will not require maintenance that is first thing it will not require distilled water to be put it inside it will have higher warranty but accordingly the cost is also high That, that's fantastic jalan i'm sure all the supply chain managers who are uh, att- who have attended us today and uh, who would watch us uh, f- in future on youtube our uh, channel uh, would be very much delighted and this is an eye opener session for all of us uh, especially for me and i thank you for the session and uh, to our viewers means you know to uh, keep us encouraging like this i would request you to you know fill up our, our uh, a uh, feedback form that is put it in the chat box uh, and uh, let us know what uh, topics you want us to cover in future and uh, keep us encouraging like this and once again i thank uh, janak for taking time out and you know uh, enlightening us with uh, uh, the knowledge that you have gathered uh, in these many uh, years and your experience and thank you thank you janak thanks rajesh thank you so much thank you